Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, bless our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Teach us from your word. May we understand with new meaning the power and the significance of faith is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to Hebrews 11. We began with 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, where the Apostle Paul speaks of our having faith, not to stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's go down to Hebrews 11. We are familiar with this passage. It lists certain giants of faith, and Hebrews 11 is going to be our principal passage of study today. And as we look at Hebrews 11, as we consider what is actually in this chapter, we're going to consider specifically a couple of verses that are familiar to all of us, and we're going to invest some time in comprehending the significance of these passages. When the Lord gave me the title for today, I wasn't sure which direction this message was going to go. Faith, what is it good for when the world is unstable? And so today we want to look at working definitions for faith because most individuals who think of faith think of faith in the context of their belief, their belief system. I'm in this particular faith or that particular faith. But is that what the Bible is speaking about? So let's get a biblical view defining faith through the lives of biblical characters. And that's why we're in Hebrews chapter 11. So let's begin, first of all, with the principles of faith as they are outlined in Hebrews chapter 11. So when we read through some of the outstanding individuals mentioned in Hebrews 11, we will understand what is being talked about. So principle number one. Faith is foundational to Christianity. It is a fundamental principle. Number two, essential for growing in Christ and the Christian life. And then principle number three, it's imperative to acceptance and engaging prophetic instruction. So without faith, we would not believe books like Daniel and Revelation. They would not make sense. But on a practical level, let's talk about three principles of faith that I believe you can leave here with. And I typically don't list things as we are doing today, but today I thought we would take a different approach and we would actually define with three Ps what faith is, and then we're going to prove that they exist in Hebrews chapter 11. First of all, number one, faith is provable. Faith is provable. Able to be proved is what that means. Faith is also predicated, which means to base or establish. To predicate means to declare or assert. And we're going to see that in Hebrews chapter 11. And then number three, faith is predictive. Faith is predictive, which means to state, tell about, or make known in advance. And this is not the same as prophecy. This is the ability, because of one's relationship with God, to see things happening before they actually occur. This is not a prophetic gift. It is simply the outgrowth of strong faith. So let's go to work on looking for the provable, the, pre the predicated, and the predictive. All right? So in Hebrews 11, where we have the record of faith, let's consider the following within the record. Record that it's provable, predicated, and predictive, all right? So let's go to work there. When we talk about faith, faith from a perspective of just a working definition of faith, when we look at the original language, it means this. It is substance, hope for, and evidence, as is noted in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. So let's go to Hebrews 11, 1. Faith 
is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we have some pivotal words in this verse, substance, hoped, and evidence. And the evidence, of course, would be of things not seen. So let's take these three words and let's work with them, first of all. Substance, that which has mass or occupies space. Now that's, an, that's a very important word. So now faith is the mass that occupies space. Think about that, that faith is actually occupying a place in the Christian's experience that cannot be easily moved. It cannot be removed once it is established. Substance, hoped for. What does hoped for in this context mean? It means to have confidence and trust. And then evidence, things or a thing that is helpful in forming a conclusion. So what we're going to see as we go through Hebrews chapter 11 and we look at these various individuals, we're going to see that they have a mass which occupies space, a confidence or trust, and they have a thing or things that are helpful in forming a conclusion. Now, that goes back to these three words, provable, predicated, and predictive, all right? So now, this is what we receive from the pen of inspiration, which supports these principles. Faith is not the ground of our salvation, but it is the great blessing. The eye that sees, the ear that hears, the feet that run, the hand that grasps, it is the means, not the end. If Christ gave his life to save sinners, why shall I not take that blessing? My faith grasps it, and thus my faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things unseen. Thus, resting, that's a peaceful word in today's turbulent society, thus resting and blessing, or believing rather, I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so now, Faith versus feeling. And you've often heard me on the Consolation Ministries line speak about we are to feeling based and not based on that which is in our minds and understanding. In other words, I feel that God is moving here. I feel that God is saying this to me. But if we will read carefully as we're going to take a look at Hebrews 11, we will see that there is no feeling involved, but there is a knowledge of the presence of God. There is a knowledge of his movements. There is a knowledge and a confidence of what he is doing. So note this quotation. Faith and feeling are as distinct as the East is from the West. Faith is not dependent on feeling. We must earnestly cry to God in faith, feeling or no feeling feeling or no feeling, and then live our prayers. Our assurance and evidence is God's word. And after we have asked, we must believe without doubting. I praise thee, O God, I praise thee. Thou hast not failed me in the performance of thy word. Thou hast revealed thyself unto me, and I am thine to do thy will. Let's take a journey now through Hebrews chapter 11. Work with me as we go through certain high points in Hebrews 11. Let's go to verse 4. Note what it says. By faith offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, that's not speaking of living after dead, of death, it's speaking of that his life was a testimony. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated in that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please who everybody? Him, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now let's look at Noah. 
By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he didn't have to see it, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he was going. Verse 9, by faith he journeyed in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, verse 11, through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive, conceive and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him, speaking of God, faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the sea shore innumerable. Speaking of Abraham's seed. Verse 13, now to this point, so we would go back to Abel, Enoch. We also have Noah, Abraham, and Sarah. Now, note verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. For truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But verse 16, but now they desire a, what everybody, better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Note, it comes back to Abraham in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had, and he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Note verse 19, very important verse. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, before we go to Isaac in verse 20, I want to take us back to the three Ps, all right? Let's go back to the three Ps. Provable, predicated, and predictive. So, Thus far, we have already seen these three Ps. First of all, provable. So we can see by their faith that they could say we can prove God, that God is faithful and that we believe in God and that we're going to depend on God. And so they were willing to prove him, prove him according to his word. But God had already proven himself to them. That's number one. Number two, predicated or Yes, predicated. So they could predicate their belief based upon God's movement in the past and so their commitment to remain faithful, even though they could not always see what was going to transpire, they remained faithful based on that which was predicated. But it was also predictive because in both the verses that described Abraham and Sarah and Noah, we have a very clear indication that they moved out even though they had not seen what they were going to see. So when you have, you have uh, Noah who precedes them, Noah builds an ark, although he has never seen rain. You have Abraham leaving his, his land of, of birth, and he goes to a place where he has never seen. And then Sarah has never seen a child born to an old woman, a woman who has moved beyond her age of childbearing, and she believes God and trusts God, and in her case, she trusts God and gives birth to the son of promise, Isaac. 
So in all three instances, including Abel, we can see that they had provable, predicated, and predictive. You can even see it in Abel. Abel was asked to present a sacrifice. That sacrifice was to be a representation of Christ, and he moved forward with obedience, never questioning, never doubting, never being curious about why. He just simply obeyed because the Lord gave that to him. All right? Now, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11, and I want us to consider some more verses. Note, as we left off with uh, Isaac, verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Verse 21, by faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. All right, let's go back to this to this other uh, this this other word that we've got to, we've got to keep in mind that this word that's so important and that is predictive. So although Joseph did not have, and this is important for us to note, Joseph did not have scripture. This is the one thing that we often forget when we look at Abel, when we look at Noah, when we look at Abraham, we look at Isaac, and we look at Jacob. And in this instance, we're looking at Joseph, the son of Jacob. None of them have had the Bible as we have. Remember, the Bible was not put together until Moses, and he wrote all of these things starting in that 40-year period that he was in the wilderness. And that is provable, and that is verifiable, both historically and theologically. But let me make sure that we understand this. So they didn't need a written record to believe that God was going to deliver them. And Joseph says, I know that God will come and he is a God of promise. He will fulfill his promise and I want my bones to go with you. When you leave Egypt, don't even leave my bones in Egypt. Take me back with you to the land of promise. Now, these are strong statements, but they also convey a strong conviction. These are individuals who didn't just live faith going to church or having worship service. These are individuals who live their faith, who believe that God, and they believe not only they believed God, they believed in God, and they believe what God said. All right? So let's go back to where we were in Hebrews 11.6. But now we want to continue. Note what it says, by faith Moses, verse 23. Follow me there. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They were not afraid of the state, all right? By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Again, not afraid of the state. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, verse 28, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. <clears throat> lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as dry land which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down, and after they were compassed about seven days. Verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them, that's the inhabitants of Jericho, that believed not when she had received the, the spies with peace. Now notice what we have here, which actually sounds prophetic, but it discloses what the Apostle Paul is, dis, is, is writing about and what has taken place to God's people through time. Notice what it says. And what shall I more say? Verse 32. For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, 
Stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight. The armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. He is speaking of their faith was so tied to God that they were not worthy of being here in this world, and the world was not worthy of them being in their presence. Note what it says. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth, and these having these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. There he concludes by speaking of Christ. So now let's look at some things that are well known about Hebrews, Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So faith is the foundation of our relationship with God. God does not reward unbelief. God does not reward unbelief. Doubters, doubters are not a part of the family of God. Although they may comprise, they may comprise the family in the sense of, of being connected, they are not counted as his, all right? And we talked about that in number 16 and other places on the Constellation Ministries line, but notice what it says. There is no encouragement given for unbelief. The Lord manifests his grace and his power over and over again. And this should teach us, underline for emphasis, it should teach us that it is always profitable under all circumstances to cherish faith, to talk faith, and to act faith. We are not to have our hearts and hands weakened by allowing the suggestions of suspicious minds to plant in our hearts the seeds of doubt and distrust. That ought to awaken us to the reality that too often when we entertain people who are pessimistic, people who are doubting, people who are questioning, people who have no faith and confidence in God, we are literally entertaining contrary voices and we should move that conversation to those who believe in the Lord and what he can do. All right, let's move beyond this to this passage. All right, these are just some very pivotal thoughts that come out of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews eleven six. now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now, all of, of what is being spoken about here in Hebrews 11 in this context was not even realized, was not even recognizable in the sense that there wasn't a prophetic voice that had disclosed that there would be an eternal life and a a city, and we. this is all before Christ. So when we talk about Abel and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they did not have the proclamation that we have. They did not have the understanding that we have. They did not have the clear, the clear line of demarcation between that which is temporal and that which is eternal in a written form. They didn't have the Bible. So if they didn't have the Bible, if they couldn't turn to this, how did they know that God had a city prepared for them. Why did they seek a better city? Why would they pursue a different life? Why would they hold on to God? Why was there faithfulness to God in the midst of all of their temptations? Why would Moses at this time, before he even receives the oracles of God, before the Holy Spirit impresses him to write the things of God, how could he hold on to the idea that Egypt was not all there was? What was it in his mind? How did he come to that understanding? And this is what we're going to find out. Note this. He, Christ, represented God, not as an essence that pervaded nature, but as God who has a personality. Christ was the express image of 
his father's person. And he came to our world to restore in man God's moral image in order that man, although fallen, might through obedience to God's commandments become instamped with the divine image and character, adorned with the beauty of divine loveliness. So even before Christ came to this world, there was a recognition of the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the truth of God, the directives of God, the principles of God. There was clarity in their minds on what God was expecting. God had communicated to them by his spirit what he wanted, and they were so detailed in their commitment to God, although they were not perfect, but they were detailed in their loyalty to God, although they sinned. They were still so focused on living for God that no matter what happened, they always kept their minds and their lives and everything about them in harmony with God. Yes, they did make mistakes. They did step out of God's divine will in some areas. But overall, their lives were totally committed to God. Let's continue, all right? Living in that better country, all right? So what does it mean to live in that better country? And note that we have that spoken of by, about Abraham and also Moses. But this is what's interesting. There was an invitation given to them, and that invitation was to the restoration of the original unfallen state. All right? Let me go back to that. All right? To inhabit a sinless environment and to live with Christ. What were the requirements? What were the requirements? To be born again, to surrender, and to be transformed. Now, when Jesus talks to Nicodemus about being born again, he asks him the question, are you not a teacher in Israel, and how is it that you don't know these things? Well, why would Jesus ask him that if this was a new doctrine? If this was a new teaching, why would he all of a sudden pitch to Nicodemus, you ought to already know this. Very simple. When Jacob wrestled with the angel who was Jesus Christ that night, he was wrestling for a transformation of his character. He wanted to be, what's the phrase? Born again. He wanted to be born again because his name even meant supplanter. He was a supplanter. In fact, he had already received by the name given him, Jacob, Jacob means supplanter, which means to take away and to deceive, and that's one of the things that Jacob was known for. But remember, with his change of character and his acceptance with God, God changes his name and calls him no more Jacob, but calls him Israel. So Nicodemus should have known that if he's going to see God, you have to have a transformation of character, and Jacob had the faith to fight with that angel until his name was changed. And that's the kind of wrestling with God that we need to have in our own lives. So the requirements to be born again, to surrender, and to be transformed. All right? Now, forsaking all. Let's look at Hebrews eleven twenty seven. Hebrews eleven twenty seven. And we've, we've looked at this, but let's look at it now on the screen. By faith he, Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. We often speak of the three Hebrew worthies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as being willing to withstand the king. But have we ever thought to go back to Moses, who did not care that the king would take his life? And we also know that he didn't fear the wrath of the king. In fact, this is mentioned twice in Hebrews 11, and we read that. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible, all right? This is important for us to note, that he saw him who is invisible. Now, if Moses did not have an understanding of the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the divinity of God, the eternal nature of God, Moses would not have understood the language that God gave him when he said, take off your shoes for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. But Moses understood that he was in the presence of God because this bush was burning and was not being consumed. And when this voice spoke to him out of the bush and said, take off your shoes, he immediately obeyed. And that too gives us an indication of what God is looking for when he shows us what he wants us to do. And when God asks us to step out on faith, when God asks us to be obedient, when God shows us what we ought to do, 
we must learn to practice immediate obedience, not to discuss with God, not to linger with God, not to try to debate with God, but to obey. So by faith, he, Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, this is an important quotation, and I really liked it as I was looking at it, because for me, it says so much about the human condition. And the human condition is one where we're always looking for other people for approval, for affirmation, for clarification, for even demonstration. Note, note what it says. Our faith must pierce the veil. Our faith must pierce the veil. Seeing things that are invisible. No one else can look for you. You must be whole for yourself. Remember when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were told to look upon that brass serpent and looking up by looking upon or beholding that brass serpent, it would provide health and healing for them. It did not make sense to them. It, wasn't, it didn't have to make sense. It was not about making sense. They had to obey. And as many as lifted up their eyes, although they had been bitten by the scorpions, as many as beheld him, then or it rather, they were saved. And that's why Jesus used that same example and said, as Moses lifted up in the, uh, the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And if I be lifted up unto, unto all, before all men, I will draw all men unto me. Now, this whole point of obedience is not negotiable. So faith is built on obedience. And as we obey Jesus, then we have faith that is activated and actuated. Note what it says. No one else can look for you. You must be whole for yourself. In the place of murmuring for blessings that are withheld, let us remember to appreciate the blessings already bestowed. How many of you take time to ask the Lord or to rather thank the Lord for all that he's done for you and name them all the way down to minute details? that God has kept you in your right mind, that God has kept you physically strong, that God has kept you able to be employed, that God has, you know, whatever it might be. And we sometimes take these things for granted, but if we learn to be grateful for what he has done, instead of murmuring for blessings that we have not received, he will give us more. I thought I'd hear a man for that, all right? God is not going to entrust more with us when we are not grateful for what he has given us, all right? So now, let's go back to the three principles of faith. Let's go back to the three principles of faith. Number one, provable. Are they able to be proved? Two, predicated. To base or establish. To predicate, to declare or assert. Number three, predictive to state, to tell about, or make known in advance. Here's what's beautiful about, about God. Moses knew that it was for them, it was time for them to be delivered. Because we, you know, we often speak about, uh, as Winston plays for us, as we get ready to close, I, I want just to think about this for just a moment, because I want this to become practical in our understanding. You know, we often think about Moses rising up and he's seeing this, He's seeing this injustice and he wants to clarify or, or, or remedy this, this issue between this Egyptian and the Hebrews and the Hebrews are not being treated appropriately or properly. I mean, it was slaves, but, you know, there obviously was some abuse that was going on that was just intolerable for him. And so he kills this Egyptian. And what was rising up in Moses at that time is something that we may overlook. And it would be easy to overlook. You see, when Abraham, the son of the covenant, the son of the promise. Well, I shouldn't say he'd call him son of promise because Isaac was son of the promise. But when Abraham, who received the covenant promise from God, Abraham was given an understanding. And remember, Abraham was told directly by God that your descendants will be enslaved in a far country for 400 years. And so Moses knew because the, the Hebrews were detailed in accounting that time. And they knew that it was time 
for the deliverer to be born or that they were to be delivered from Egypt. And so Moses had within him this burning desire to see that prophecy fulfilled. And because he wanted to see that prophecy fulfilled, he inserted himself in what God was going to remedy through miraculous and divinely ordered means. And so he killed that Egyptian because he had a burden not for social justice, but for the justice of God in his name. And so you and I must never forget that we can't get in God's way. We must be careful not to get in his way. We must be careful not to insert ourselves because we know that things are going to happen prophetically. Let's go back to something that we were speaking about earlier as we close and as we think in terms of what was happening this week on Thursday when I had that luncheon with that preacher who brought his church into keeping the seventh day Sabbath. And when we look at these things, faith, provable, Predicated, predictive. If the Bible is true, one way or another, that preacher had to run into himself. You wonder what am I talking about? If he had drilled in his mind when he was a young man and he went to church school and his mother, well, if she was bold, she had to be a, a, a strong mother. I didn't know it that way, but she had to be a strong mother because any mother who would come on the, the line of the radio station, all right, when he went live and say, now, son, yes, I do have something to say. You should not be playing the devil's music, all right? I mean, that, that's a pretty direct mother, all right? That's a pretty strong mother. But that's the same mother that poured into him that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou know thy son, know thy daughter, know thy manservant, know thy maidservant, know thy cattle, know thy stranger that is within thy gates. So provable. The faith that had been instilled in her son and she's been dead for a long time, it still bears fruit. Predicated to base or establish. She could base and establish her desire to see him walk in truth and in righteousness because she had seen children in the Bible turn around when they had been taught or trained to write. Pre predictive. Ultimately, he would have to come face to face with what he believed. And this is what's so fascinating, that when we come face to face with truth, if we decide not to live the truth, not to adhere to the truth, not to follow the truth, we have to go way out of our way to despise the truth. We have to begin to then prove that we reject the truth. And so whenever we see people who have been in truth leave the truth, they are more wicked than the people who are wicked. Have you ever noticed that? Oh, yeah. And why? Because they want to prove that they don't believe. They want to prove that they are not a follower. They want to prove that they're not adhering. They want to prove that they are not going to walk in truth and righteousness. But if you're not going to work at proving that God is true or working against it, that God is true, then you have to submit to it. You have to surrender to it. And this is what he said to me. He said, he said, the Holy Spirit came to me and said, called his name. He said, you have to do this. You have to do this. And so the Holy Spirit speaking to him and telling him what he had to do connected with what his mother had told him years ago. So faith is not a feeling. It's a principle. It's provable. We can prove it. You can look at those who have gone before that Paul mentions and even others. It's predicated. You can base it on that which is real. You can declare it. You can assert it. You can speak about it as though it has already been done. Remember we just read the passage where Abraham believed that Christ was able to raise up his son even if he slew him. Had he ever seen a resurrection before? We don't know, but we don't have record of that. But he believed it. 
predictive, to state, to tell about, or to make known in advance. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction. What does that mean? He didn't want the things of this world. He was looking for, he and the others, for a city whose builder and maker is God. My brothers and sisters, it's not that faith is not available to us. It's do we want it? Do we cherish it? Do we cling to it? It's ours to have. And faith is built. Faith is constructed. Faith is developed. And every time we act on faith, every time we obey God, our faith is strengthened. Our faith is strengthened. Our faith is improved. Our faith grows. And so my brothers and sisters, my final question to us today, do you want to have that kind of faith that they had? To be steadfast, to be unmovable, to be always abounding in the word of the Lord. You want that faith? I want that faith. Let's kneel together. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, our Redeemer and friend in Christ Jesus, I pray, Father, that you will take the things that these frail lips of clay sought to express today and root them and ground them in our hearts. Lord, faith is what we all need. As you've taken care of your children throughout history, you will take care of us. As you have shown them, or as you showed them in times past, how to live and how to be free in Christ Jesus, Lord, you're showing that to us today. Lord, as we give ourselves over to you and as we surrender our lives to you at this very moment, we ask that you would help us to keep our minds stayed on Jesus. There are many distractions and there are many challenges that we're facing right now. Our budgets are getting stretched thin. Resources seem to be diminishing. Prices are increasing and war is talked about day in and day out. There are many things that we cannot explain, but we know that you indeed, O oh Lord, hold all things under your care and your power. And whatever you permit to come upon us, we can trust you. You're provable. Because we have watched you in the past. We have read about you in the past. And that which you have done before, you can do again. And that which is visible to us, we can speak about. And that which is invisible to us, we can believe. Because it's predicated on fact and truth. And as you have been a God who led in the past, you're the same God for you are a God who changes not. And Lord, we can talk about the future because we have seen fulfillment of things that you have defined and you have classified. So Father, we pray that you will give us the strength and the wisdom and the ability to hold fast and to believe even when we cannot see our way to the end. We'll do it, Lord, because you said that we can trust you. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Lord, fulfill those words, we pray, in Jesus' precious name. 
Amen and Amen.